Hey everyone, Michael Unger here from the HR McMillan Space Center, here with our first Ask an Astronomer of 2021. Uh, and as most times, we are joined with our astronomer, Rachel. How's it going, Rachel? Pretty good, yeah, thanks. How's your uh, 2021 going so far? Uh, it's okay. I had a goal to uh, start running and increase my pace, okay. and I increased it from zero, so I think that that is a, <laughs> a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's an improvement. I made a goal to uh, get rid of the moths that are in my house that uh, chewed oh. up all of my sweaters uh, because I don't normally wear sweaters. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. let's uh, eat some, let's um, wear some sweaters. It's getting a little bit chilly, and then they're all eaten by moths. So I, I took a uh, I took some cleaning to, to task over top the holidays to get rid of those. Uh, but we are here for the next half an hour to get into our top ten stories to look forward to in 2021. Now, of course, uh, like everything in the universe, sometimes we have surprises. Last year, we had a comet uh, that uh, took us by surprise. Uh, but at this moment, we can anticipate what we think might be the top 10 stories. And we have um, a great uh, list uh, ready for you today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on YouTube Live. Uh, if you are here, uh, let us know where you're watching in the chat. And as we go through, if you have any questions, throw them into the chat we will answer them live uh, and of course if you want to get into any of the topics besides the ones that we're talking about we'll get into those too uh, this next half hour we are here for you uh, so Rachel uh, let's get started uh, for, with our top 10 uh, are they like in uh, chronological order or are they in like uh, an order of your favorites order of my favorites so and what I'm most excited about for sure. Okay, well let's yeah. let's let's start then with your most anticipated story of 2021. Sure. And that just happens to be the Mars arrivals that are all happening in February. It's a very exciting time. And so three robots are expected to land on Mars. Why are they all arriving at the same time? It's because there's this really special window where it costs the least amount of fuel and the least amount of money coincidentally to fly anything from Earth to Mars. And that happens once every 26 months. So we have a lot of space agencies trying to capitalize on that. And so for the first time, because these are all arriving at the same time, we'll have China, Europe, Russia, and the US could all have vehicles operating at the, on the red planet all simultaneously, all at once, which is pretty cool. But landing on Mars is very challenging. Only about 40% of the missions ever sent to Mars by any space agency has been successful. So We'll see how many uh, end up making it there. So on the left here, we have Perseverance. It's the fifth rover to attempt a Mars landing. And it'll touch down on February 18th, just after noon. And during the landing, the rover will pass through this very thin Martian atmosphere. It has a heat shield to protect it. And it'll be entering at a speed of 20,000 kilometers per hour. And because it's so fast, it does have a parachute to slow it down. And it also has a very large sky crane that will lower the rover onto the surface. So I showed, I'm showing a Curiosity sky crane. So the same thing's gonna happen with Perseverance being lowered to uh, the surface. And it's going to land in the same place in the Jezero crater. And then in the middle here, we have uh, the Hope Orbiter. So when it gets there, the team selected science instruments for a very special orbit that would help paint a more comprehensive picture of the Martian atmosphere. And because it has such a wide and kind of elliptical and distant trajectory, the probe will be the first to be able to study the weather cycles and variation over many different geographic areas on Mars. And so the team is hoping that this orbiter, this Hope orbiter, will be the first true weather satellite on Mars. And on the right here, we have the Tianwen rover, which will arrive as well. It'll have cameras and instruments for studying Mars's climate and geology, and even an instrument to zap rocks and record the resulting chemical signatures, just like Curiosity and Perseverance have. And it also has a radar, which works by shooting radio waves into the surface, measuring the reflection times and what happens, and that gives a scientist a 3D picture of what's going on underneath. So I think it's pretty cool. Now, are the Perseverance rover and the Tianwen rover, are they going to be landing in uh, similar areas on Mars? Are they going to be close together? That's a great question. So here we have the landing sites uh, <laughs> the and the Perseverance rover. And the, they're here um, up in the right uh, in yellow. So they're quite close together. 
uh, but they will be looking at different things. So hopefully we get a lot of information from that. When you said that they uh, had lasers on board, like I imagine like if the rovers, uh, because they're from separate countries, you know, if they come close to each other, if they're going to like zap each other, uh, if they're like, hey, that's a really interesting rock. Like, no, I want to uh, check out that rock instead. <laughs> a robot battle on a distant planet. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is great because, you know, we're going to be really delving into Mars for all of February. In fact, uh, as we open up more every weekend, we're going to be doing some events here on site. So all of February, we're going to be delving into what we're going to call Mars, the planet of robots. And we're going to all be culminating around that date of February the 18th. Is that, is that correct, Rachel? Of yes. when Perseverance is landing. And we're going to be doing a cosmic night. So the evening of February 18th, we're going to be joined uh, with Dr. Tanya Harrison, uh, who actually worked on uh, figuring out where to land the Perseverance rover. Uh, so it's going to be really great. Uh, Rachel and I will be joined uh, with her. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be doing um, some presentations, but we'll also be doing some quizzes as well. Uh, so this is exciting. Lots of stuff uh, around Mars. Uh, three all arriving at once. It's like an abundance of Mars all at once. Um, let's move on to question, or sorry, not question. Let's move on to your second favorite uh, news story of 2021. Sure, and I'm sure some of you can guess. I think this is your most anticipated one, Michael, and it's the James Webb Space yes. Telescope launch. Yes, question mark. so exactly, it's a really big <laughs> question mark too. So we have no idea whether or not it will launch just because I feel like I've been hurt by NASA before. I'm not sure if they'll make the 2021 launch, but I'm hoping that they will because the James Webb Space Telescope will be the successor to Hubble and we know that Hubble had a lot of these really high definition, extremely beautiful photos of these distant galaxies. And what James Webb will be able to do is it's looking in a different wavelength range. So Hubble was looking in the visible light and James Webb will be looking in the infrared. So it has infrared vision. And the reason why that's important is because it helps us look deeper and further away and actually further back in time. So, uh, and the reason for that is I can show you a comparison. Here we have on the left-hand side is something that Hubble would see if it was looking in the visible range. And on the right-hand side, we have the infrared view that James Webb would have. And you'll notice that there's a lot more stars here. And that's because the infrared allows James Webb to look right through all this dust and gas that's in the way that would have obscured it for a telescope like Hubble. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think there's a, a bit of a perception, you know, when you think about, you know, how James Webb is not going to be seeing the way that Hubble sees. And we are so used, I think, to seeing these beautiful pictures like we see on the left there, uh, just all the different colors and the, the dynamism of, of what's going on inside of this nebula. And on the right, you know, now I'm looking at it now, I'm like, wow, it's even more captivating because of all the stars that we don't see over there on the left. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what kind of images uh, James Webb is going to give us. Awesome. Uh, so yes, we got tons of people watching, uh, mostly from Vancouver. Got also got some from Calgary as well. So welcome everyone. If you have any questions about anything, uh, please put it into the chat. So James Webb, uh, a spooky uh, launch on uh, October 31st, hopefully of 2020. Let's move on to your number three top story of 2021. Sure. And that is Capstone, which stands for a very long name. It's Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. I wrote that down because I could not remember it, um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's quite long. But Capstone is a planned lunar orbiter that will test and verify the calculated orbital stability that's planned for the Lunar Gateway Space Station. Lunar Gateway, if you haven't heard of it, is basically the ISS, but orbiting around the moon. And it'll orbit for at least six months to demonstrate that this orbit is stable and it's safe and it'll test communications with Earth as well. And it's because it has this really special orbit and you'll see that it looks a little weird. It looks very, very elliptical and there, there's a special reason for this. So this orbit is known as a halo orbit and for Capstone and eventually the Lunar Gateway, It'll travel from its closest position to the moon, so up on the top here at 1,600 kilometers, and to a distant uh, 70,000 kilometers here on the bottom. So Capstone will be a very good example of how to transition and operate from this really weird looking orbit. 
And it's really necessary for not only when we're constructing the gateway, but also for later logistics for moving and transferring crews and supplies. And it's weird looking because this gives us better communication with the Lunar Gateway. So you'll see that um, Earth in the background there, we are always in contact with Capstone or with the Lunar Gateway as it's going around. And it just so happens that this orbit is the, uh, the prime spot for Earth and Moon, their gravity to balance out. And this is uh, really exciting for Canadians because just at the end of last year, uh, the Canadian Space Agency announced that they had a new partnership with NASA to be part of the Lunar Gateway project. We're going to be building Canada Arm 3, uh, and uh, that's a big uh, uh, source of pride for us Canadians that we have that Canada arm uh, that was on our money. So we're going to put a third Canada arm on this space station, and that means that we also get to see and Canadian astronauts as well. Uh, so that's going to be really exciting on to Lunar Gateway uh, as well as potentially on the surface. And just looking at this uh, GIF of the orbit, I'm now realizing that those astronauts, as they board the Lunar Gateway, they will be the furthest humans away from the Earth because back in the Apollo days, they just orbit around the moon in a very sort of like a much tighter orbit. But this is a much uh, more elliptical orbit, which means they'll be further than any humans have ever been before. That's interesting that you point that out. Yeah. And I also like to think that we have the first Canadian that's going to orbit the moon as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to your number four top story. Sure, and this is a fun one. So this is called DART, and it's a planetary defense test of technologies for preventing an impact of Earth by a hazardous asteroid. So DART will be the first demonstration of what they call a kinetic impactor technique to change the motion of an asteroid in space. And what that really means is that they're going to fly the spacecraft and smash it into an asteroid and see if it moves and changes course. <laughs> so <laughs> the DART spacecraft is going to deliberately launch itself at approximately seven kilometers per second into this rock. And with the aid of an onboard camera known as Draco, an autonomous navigation software, it'll be able to change the asteroid in its orbit by a fraction of 1%. So it's not uh, a lot, but it does change the orbital period. So the orbital period of the asteroid is changed by several minutes, even though the deflection is only uh, a fraction of 1%. And because the orbital period differs so much, we can actually observe it and measure it using telescopes on Earth. So it won't do much, but it will do enough. <laughs> Yeah, and I think this is uh, what we call the Armageddon technique, uh, the uh, sci-fi film uh, where they sent up, but there they sent up a, a bomb to uh, blow up the inside uh, of the asteroid. And here, we're just flying a spacecraft, smashing into it, hoping to redirect it. So not blow it up, just nudge it a bit so that it misses Earth, right? Yes, and I would love to know or see when they were coming up with this plan and they were like, sitting at a table and being like, ha, huh, this, this is the solution. Let's just smash something into it. <laughs> I always like to think of this as like a, like a pool table. I grew up yeah. uh, playing uh, billiards a lot uh, and seeing balls sort of like smash into each other and roll into each other. Um, you know, I see the solar system as kind of being uh, a big pool table just with no friction. Yeah. Let's move on to our number five story, uh, your favorite story of 2021. Here we go, and it's Lucy. Lucy is the first space mission to explore a population of small bodies known as Trojan asteroids, and you see them here in green on the left-hand side. Now, these Trojans are essentially like time capsules from the birth of our solar system more than four billion years ago, and they're thought to be remnants of primordial material that form the outer planets, so right at the beginning of our solar system. And it'll launch in October 2021 with boosts from Earth's gravity, It'll have it'll go on a 12 year journey to eight different asteroids. It'll go visit a main belt asteroid and seven Trojans, and four of which are members of what I'm going to call a kind of two for one binary system because they're all um, stuck in this binary orbit. And the spacecraft's orbital path is shown here in red. And what Lucy's going to do, it's going to study the surface geology, the color and composition, and the interior and general properties of the Trojans, and also look for rings and satellites around them. But at this point, you're probably wondering, what is a Trojan exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, the, it's those, it's those uh, people with the funny hats, right? 
<laughs> not quite. You're not close at all. <laughs> so they're <laughs> different from regular asteroids because these are asteroids that are in our solar system that orbit the sun in front of and behind our gas giant Jupiter and at the same distance from the sun as Jupiter. So you see these here in green and in the bottom it's in white. And the gas giant is massive enough that normally it scatters away all these asteroids in its vicinity, but because of the very special combined gravitational influences of the Sun and Jupiter, these Trojan asteroids have been trapped in stable orbits and we call them Lagrange points. So it's almost like they're stuck in a well and they can't get out. Mm. And these Trojans are really, really unique because they provide a never before explored sample of the remnants of our early solar system. And no other space mission in history has been launched to as many different destinations in different orbits around our sun. And another thing about Lagrange points, actually JWST would be pace, placed at L2 over there if it does go up this year. <laughs> so, but around Earth, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so these and these Trojan asteroids, like they're fairly new. Like we didn't, we, we sort of thought of them as all being part of the asteroid belt, but they, their concept is is fairly new, right? Yeah. So that term popped up. Um, I'm going to say for me, it was not that long ago, but uh, it's it would be hard to tell, right? Because the the main belt asteroid belt or the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. So having just a population that seems to be going the same direction would be hard to differentiate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that our view of the solar system has changed you know, so much since I went to I went to school. Things were so much simpler now. We just had we had asteroids. And now, even inside of the asteroid belt, there's different categories. Um, and uh, if anyone out there watches the Expanse, you know that there's lots to explore once you get out into that region of space. Uh, so Trojan asteroids, Lucy mission, uh, excited mm -hmm. for that. Let's move on to your next top story of 2021. Sure. It's funny that you mentioned The Expanse because I just started watching it actually. I'm finishing up season four. I'm just catching up. It's very good. Um, no, sp no spoilers, <laughs> no. anyone, because I still haven't uh, I still haven't started watching. I was waiting for it to end and then I'm going mm -hmm. to try to binge it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so speaking of learning new things about what we thought we knew a lot about, here is the Chandrayaan-3 mission from the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO. And it's the third lunar exploration mission from this agency. And it's following Chandrayaan-2, where a hiccup in communication resulted in a failed landing attempt. So this is a repeat mission that will demonstrate a soft, land, soft landing attempt that will include a lander and a rover, but it won't have an orbiter like the previous mission did. And they plan to land on the south pole of the moon, which was the previous spacecraft target destination, so the same place. And the scientific goals are pretty much the same. They aim to demonstrate that soft landing, operate the rover on the surface, and in terms of research, they're hoping to study the lunar topographies, so the physical features on the surface, mineralogy, elemental abundance, the exosphere, and signatures of hydroxyl and water ice. So if successful, the ISRO will be the world's fourth space agency to conduct a soft lunar landing after the former USSR, NASA, and CNSA. I'm really excited to see this. I remember I watched the Chandrayaan 2 uh, attempted landing live and it was you know it seemed really disappointing at the time when it failed but we see so often in space with a lot of these missions that the quite often like the initial tries you know we call them failures but we learn so much from these failures and I'm really uh, encouraged to see that they're right back at it that they didn't see it as a complete failure that we can't do this and I think it's a great lesson for anyone when you're starting off and you're learning to do something you know like a uh, country like India, their space program is relatively new, and now they are poised to uh, the land a rover on the moon. I'm really excited to see this happen. Me too. And it's difficult landing on a distant moon or a distant planet. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to our number seven story of 2021. Sure. So this is the Chinese Large Modular Space Station. Modular as in it's basically the same as the ISS and that it's basically a gigantic Lego set that we assemble up in space. So it's a planned space station that'll be placed in low Earth orbit, and it's roughly around one fifth the mass of the ISS, so a little bit smaller. And the hope is that research conducted on this new station will improve their ability to conduct experiments in space beyond the current capabilities offered by China's currently existing space laboratories. 
And the construction of the space station is part of the third phase of the Tiangong program and is scheduled to be completed sometime before 2022. So first generation space stations like Skylab, uh, Skylab like I have here on the right, were single piece stations and not designed for resupply. And then we have second generation stations like Tiangong 1 and 2 are designed for mid, mid missions resupply. So we see that here on the bottom right. But third generation stations like the ISS and like this space station, they are assembled on orbit from pieces that were launched separately. And so this type of modular design is really good because it helps improve reliability, reduces costs, it shortens the development cycle, and also allows for more diversified tasks. Yeah, and more than ever, the past couple of years, seeing the international presence now in space is just uh, paramount. You know, China, <laughs> India, the European Space Agency, uh, along with NASA, this is incredible. And, it, and even looking forward to that expands future, you know, uh, in that future, everyone is, it's Earthlings, and then it's the Martians, and then it's the Belters, right? So, um, but getting there to that step of, all of us on this planet going out into space and calling us all Earthlings is a little bit ways away. We're still, you know, segmented. We're still in different um, in different countries. By getting to that point, we're all collaborating together. This is a, a great first step, and I'm really excited to see uh, the future of international space collaboration. Our first question, actually, let's stay on this uh, Chinese. Uh, space station. So first question from Charlie is asking, have they uh, sent up any of the first pieces of the space station yet? Or is this the, the first uh, iteration uh, that they're going to be sending up later this year? I believe it's the first iteration. I don't think that they've sent anything up quite yet, which is why we see the artist rendition here and not a, uh, a photograph of what it looks like. But I imagine that they would send maybe one or two of the modular pieces first and not send all of it all, all at once, just to see if it operates okay in space. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our top, uh, or number eight story of 2021. So this is a total eclipse that's gonna happen and it's viewable from Vancouver, so that's always good. So total eclipses of the moon happen at a full moon when the sun, earth, and moon are aligned to form a line. There's a special astronomical term for it and it's called a syzygy and I love that word and I think <laughs> it's very great for trivia. And it comes from the Greek word of being paired together. So during a total lunar eclipse, the Earth comes between the sun and the moon and blocks any direct sunlight from reaching the moon. So you can see that here in the bottom right. The sun casts the Earth's shadow onto the moon's surface and it looks dark. So that's a lunar eclipse. So to see the lunar eclipse from Vancouver, you'll want to look close to the horizon early in the morning, 4 a.m. and toward the southwest. And you might have heard of this kind of moon being called a blood moon because it has a reddish color. And that's caused by Earth completely blocking out direct sunlight from reaching the moon. And the only light that is there is light that's reflected off a lunar surface and has been refracted and changed a little bit by our atmosphere. So the light appears reddish for the same reason that a sunrise or sunset would appear red. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, 4 a.m. might be a little bit too early for me, but you know what? Every time that I have actually done it, uh, I really enjoy the view that blood red moon is just, it's spooky, but it's just, it reminds you that, you know, that we're on a planet, you know, like we kind of forget you know, the sunrise becomes uh, the moonrise becomes so normal and we get uh, used to it. But when we see a total solar eclipse and that moon turn, you know, red, it really reminds you that we are moving through space and uh, it's a really wonderful grounding uh, as I like to, uh, as I like to say, let's go back to the Chinese space station. Cause we had a question about, um, you know, the, the Chinese space agency. So is that just China that's working on that or are they collaborating with anyone else? It's just China because uh, the UC NSA and other space agencies ha kind of have a kerfuffle and that <laughs> involves the ISS. And actually the CNSA has publicly announced that they do want to work with NASA and other agencies on things like the ISS in the future. So it'll be exciting to see all of our space agencies come together and work truly globally. Yeah. 
And you know what? You know, space agencies like classically are bipartisan. And it's I find it really interesting because like the people that work at NASA, the people that work at the Canadian Space Agency, the people that probably work um, for the Chinese Space Agency, they're very kind of like apolitical because they know that what the work that they're doing will continue no matter kind of like who is in government. And I uh, find it really um, encouraging because those are also the people that are collaborating with each other. And uh, this really sort of like gives you a very sort of a global uh, view like well, let's all work together in space and let's all let's, let's forget about the politics for now and hopefully we can use space to kind of bring us all together that's the beauty of science right like it's just learning and sharing what we learn yeah uh let's move on uh number eight was our lunar eclipse so number nine so i'm actually going to do nine and ten together uh because they're talking both about solar eclipses so a solar eclipse always occurs about two weeks before or after a lunar eclipse. So they come in pairs. So usually there's two eclipses in a row, one being lunar, one being solar. But sometimes you can have three during the same eclipse season. And this is because we get eclipses when the Earth, Moon, Sun system are in a very special particular alignment. So when the Moon is in this perfect place, the next one will appear in about two weeks because it's in, it just so happens to be in the right plane, in the right place for that to happen. And the next solar eclipse is happening on June 10th, and it's visible from eastern Canada, and we call it an annular solar eclipse. And that's because the moon is too far away to completely cover up the sun's disk, leaving the sun's visible outer edges to form a sort of ring or fire or annulus around the moon. You see that here on the left-hand side. And the it's next- It's kind of like a big yeah. ring light. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of ominous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Most of your sun missing. But the next total solar eclipse is on December 4th, and it's different from an annual eclipse in that the sun's disk is fully obscured by the moon, but that is visible from Antarctica. So unless you'd like to go uh, visit, <laughs> visit Antarctica, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, so for here in Vancouver, the solar eclipses are not going to be a thing. But of course, there's, we have uh, people watching from all over the world, maybe even from Antarctica. Who knows? Uh, so if you are, definitely check those out. All right. Uh, we have our top 10 stories of 2021. If you have any questions about any of that, uh, we have about uh, just a few more minutes uh, left. But we have one bonus story uh, that I got really excited and sent to you, Rachel. Uh, something that happened just a few weeks ago um not our top 10 story but our maybe the first uh story of 2021 they got me excited i wanted to put this first because i am very <laughs> excited for this um but what it is is it's space wine so there was a company that sent a bunch of bottles of wine up into the iss to be orbiting orbiting around the earth for one year and so they're just going to come down um soon and they wanted to see the effects of what being in space for a year would be on wine. And the reason for that is because they are looking at uh, improving agriculture. So because of climate change happening here on Earth, plants on Earth will have to adapt to harsher and harsher conditions. So what harsher conditions are there than space? So I don't know. So in the name of science, we sent a bunch of alcohol into space <laughs> and there, there will be some <laughs> taste testings, which I wish I could be a part of, but uh, there's only a few lucky people who get to do that. Yeah, it's really interesting thinking of, you know, what climate change is going to do to a lot of uh, crops, including wine, you know, places mm -hmm. like France uh, and like California, you know, that, you know, it's probably good news for us in British Columbia, maybe, you know, uh, places uh, maybe even in northern Br British Columbia might actually start to become uh, wine regions. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, space is always a great place to, to test this all out. Uh, and this is making me thirsty. So hopefully we can uh, we can share a wine together sometime soon, Rachel. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, so great. Uh, thanks so much uh, for everyone for joining us here on our first Ask an Astronomer of the Year. We will be back in two weeks. So on the 28th, January 28th. But if you go to our website, we are now open in some capacity. Our planetarium and science theaters aren't open quite yet. But if you go to our website, uh, you will see um, you can buy a ticket and you can come and visit us. Uh, we have our observatory open. We have some live demonstrations and our gallery and so that's every weekend 
And then going into February, we've got lots of really fun events. February 10th is Space Debris Day. Uh, if you don't know what Space Debris Day, check it out is when we're talking all about orbiting satellites, lots of stuff that's flying around uh, in space. So that is going to be a wonderful panel that we're going to have on February 10th. February 14th is Valentine's Day. So we're going to have an, another online event uh, all about um, being at home in space and the theme of connection. And there's going to have a really special uh, opportunity. If you want to shout somebody out that you missed uh, over this past year or so, you can send us an email, tell us who you'd like to dedicate a star to. And Rachel and I will find a star and we'll talk about it. We'll fly to it uh, during the program. It's going to be really fun. Uh, we're going to geek out as well with some trivia and giveaway prizes so that's on february 14th and of course like i mentioned february 18th is our cosmic night cosmic night all about perseverance going to mars uh well rachel uh great to see you again i will see you in two weeks for everyone for out sure. there in youtube land see you then as well